so in terms of the combat, have you guys taken a different approach this time around? And what has been your general approach to combat? I really want to make sure that everyone knows that just because the game is in uh, over-the-shoulder perspective, a third-person perspective, it's not RE4, you know. RE4 was over the shoulder, but it, at a, con in a conceptual level, it was also designed to be a more of a shooter game. So you have plenty of ammo. Since it's Halloween, assuming this video is finished before Halloween's passed, <laughs> yeah, no. I've been playing a lot of Resident Evil games, and after mulling it over a bit, I can safely say that after more than a decade, Resident Evil 4 is still my favorite of the series, just above RE Remake. I know, controversial opinions, right? If you were playing video games in 2005, especially horror games, there's absolutely no way you weren't aware of Resident Evil 4. When it was first released, it was one of the biggest titles of its era, not only just for the survival horror genre, but the medium as a whole. Gamers, journalists, and game creators were tripping over themselves to shower the game with praise, and for good reason. Even after 13 years since its initial release, Resident Evil 4 is an exceptionally well-made game that brought some new life to a series that was in danger of being discontinued. The hordes of ganados that strategically attempt to surround you while sidestepping your headshots, the solid third-person combat that was restrictive enough to add suspense to moments but gave you enough agency to survive through said hordes, the dynamic difficulty system that adjusted to how well you played to ensure there was always tension but not frustration, even the way the game used its sound was amazing, being able to build a feeling of anxiety just through the distant sound of a chainsaw or the wheezing of a regenerator. However, despite its massive critical success since 2005, and the fact it directly inspired many survival horror titles that followed, Resident Evil 4 is also a divisive title of sorts, both for fans of RE and horror games. Resident Evil as a series pioneered the survival horror genre, creating this slow, atmospheric tension as you explored the Spencer Mansion, and in later games, Raccoon City. But the fourth mainline title shift towards larger scale fights and action schlock was an infamous turning point that started a strange descent for the series, gradually shedding everything that made Resident Evil what it was in the eyes of the fans, to the point that it wasn't even recognizable as the same survival horror games with releases like RE6 or Operation Raccoon City, resembling more of the same bland third-person action games that the market was already oversaturated with during the early 2010s. As of the last decade or so, Resident Evil 4 has become bad almost by proxy for some, because it was the originator for a lot of the issues that became so prevalent throughout the series, and even other horror titles. Only recently has Resident Evil started to recapture the tense horror tones that made the originals what they were, with the Revelation spin-offs and last year's RE7. But even a decade later, Resident Evil 4's influence in the series is still apparent. Essentially, 4 can be seen as both the savior and downfall of survival horror, depending on your personal perspective on the genre. But the question is, how did this happen, where a game is so equally beloved and criticized? Well, let's head down to our local undisclosed Spanish village for bingo night, and take a look at how RE4 changed Resident Evil and survival horror games alike for more than a decade. This is my... Resident Evil 4 Retrospective Welcome! Starting in early 1999, Resident Evil 4 went through an extremely muddled development that would end up shaping what it would become. After the success of RE2, series creator Shinji Mikami and Capcom wanted to keep the series going onto Sony's new PlayStation 2 that was fast approaching believing the new generation of consoles would help the Resident Evil series from falling into a rut. Not wanting the fans to have to wait for the new console generation for the next game though, they promoted a spin-off title and development team into what would be Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, and had Hideki Kamiya and his dev team that worked on RE2 move on to the fourth game's development for the PS2. Due to the success of the second game, Mikami wanted to act in a more managerial role with the Resident Evil series, and gave free reigns to Kamiya to create whatever game he and his team could envision. However, this would be the first of many decisions that would begin the flanderization of the Resident Evil series. You see, Kamiya isn't much of a horror fan, 
despite making what many would consider to be one of the best survival horror games ever. So his project ended up leaning much more on making the player feel cool during enemy encounters, creating a story about a young Tony Redgrave investigating into his mysterious supernatural powers, which resulted in the gameplay going from ammo management survival horror to action-focused combos and the ability to juggle enemies in the air. While he was interested in seeing Resident Evil going in a new direction, this focus on style and coolness resulted in Mikami believing that the game was deviating too far from what the series was, ironic considering where it was going, and proposed that this prototype become its own separate title. So the dev team was split in two in order to work on this new title and RE4 respectively, and this other game would of course become the obscure little title Devil May Cry, which I'm not sure if I've ever talked about on this channel before. Despite the development team splitting up to work on these titles as separate projects though, it's hard not to notice the lingering fingerprints of DMC's development all over 4. The game being broken up into chapters, a large section of the game being set in a European castle with some arbitrary locks to its doors, and the game ending with a hero riding a vehicle out of a crumbling island alongside a blonde female side character. But one of the more subtle touches of DMC's influence was the heavier emphasis on camp action than any of the previous titles, which we'll be getting to later. After development shifted with DMC, RE4 was then planned to be part of the Capcom 5, five Capcom games that were intended to be exclusive releases for Nintendo's financially struggling GameCube console, with Mikami even being quoted that if Resident Evil 4 appeared on anything but the GameCube, that he would cut off his own head. And at E3 2003, Mikami presented a version of RE4 that would later be referred to as the Hookman build, that, when compared to previous games, resembled something closer to the Clock Tower series than the original Resident Evils. Using assets from a previous RE4 build that was shown off at TGS the year prior that was later scrapped, the game would have RE2 protagonist Leon Kennedy investigating a haunted mansion, hallucinating visions of killer dolls and suits of armors out to get him, and a mysterious hookman that would regularly appear throughout the game similar to the nemesis from RE3. From looking at early demos, the hookman version of RE4 was exactly what Mikami was hoping for from the next mainline game in the series, something that at its core still had what made a classic Resident Evil game, but added a slight twist to the concept past zombie outbreaks in a mountainside city. Mikami was so confident in this version of the game that he even warned those at E3 Don't pee your pants. However, while the Hookman version of the game held a lot of potential, and audiences seemed quite interested in the final product, it was ultimately cancelled due to it being too costly to have to develop two versions of every 3D model to accommodate Leon's hallucination trips, on top of the game being too big for the GameCube's cookie-sized optimal discs. So the writers of this version of the game would carry their work into Haunting Grounds development, and the dev team started from scratch yet again. Following the cancellation of the Hookman version, RE4 went through another handful of other builds and drafts with different takes. Another lesson in don't show off your game in publications until you have a finalized version decided. The dev team just couldn't seem to get a satisfactory approach to how they would design this fourth game and after RE0 and Remake didn't sell as well as Capcom expected, they were even more concerned with what they needed to do to bring new life into the series, disregarding the fact that they were released in the early years of the GameCube, so even the best games weren't going to sell to Capcom's expectations. What was especially concerning though was that if this game didn't sell to their expectations, Capcom appeared to be fully prepared to discontinue the series. Under this pressure, Mikami was struggling in a constant cycle, between trying to push the series past the same old zombie game that Resident Evil had started to get stuck in, and deviating too far from what made it what it was, on top of making sure that the GameCube could run whatever game they created, since a couple of iterations were scrapped due to hardware limitations. Eventually though, after redirecting their focus a bit, he and his team had a breakthrough on how they wanted to approach Resident Evil 4, and taking a lot of what had come out of these previous builds forward, started creating what would be the new face of Resident Evil. Miralo, está herido. 
At the end of 2004, after five years of development, two other games created, and many unfinished builds, Capcom was putting a lot of its eggs into Resident Evil 4, funding multiple ad campaigns across countries in order to promote the game as much as possible, especially in the West. There was a hope the newest Resident Evil was going to be the next major hit. Or else. Regardless of fans' weariness towards some of the changes they were seeing from early looks and demos. Going from the introduction of the game, following the ending of Resident Evil 3 resulting in Raccoon City's mass destruction and the government cover-up, Leon got a major promotion since his first day as an RPD officer, to now working as a guard for the US president, with his first mission being to go out and locate their missing daughter in a vague location in Spain where locals speak a Mexican dialect, which basically establishes the campy 2000s action movie tone that the rest of the game is going to carry on. Though this wasn't that far off from what people had come to expect of Resident Evil games, but was more or less just leaning into it at this point. The first significant change to the series was immediately noticeable once the game hands over controls to the player, and that is the over-the-shoulder perspective. RE4 kept all the classic tank control movements of the original games, but placing the camera so that it followed the character rather than be placed in key areas of the map was surprising for some, since it shifted the focus from the setting and the player's relation to it, to Leon's forward facing perspective and the ability to see a larger scope of the area surrounding the player, allowing for more precision in aiming as well as a better understanding of where enemies and other objects of importance are like axes being flung at Leon's forehead. This wasn't the first Resident Evil game to include a third-person perspective, since Dead Aim did this a few years prior, but 4 was a mainline game, and removing something that was considered so attached to the series seemed crazy to some. Or at least, that's what it seemed like. Now as a preface it, I adore the static cameras of classic RE. As someone that loves great cinematography, especially in video games and horror, the early Resident Evil series is an amazing example of how camera perspective can convey the emotion or story of a game just by where it's placed during a scene. The camera angles in early Resident Evils, and to a certain extent the tank controls, were a clever workaround hardware limitations, as the pre-rendered backgrounds that made them so graphically advanced for their time didn't allow for the first-person POV that Mikami originally intended for the games to have, and went with a fixed camera angle instead after being inspired by Alone in the Dark. As Resident Evil went into the PS2 GameCube era though, it was almost inevitable that the series would move toward different camera types, because while the static camera created tense and, dare I say, cinematic moments in the previous RE games, it was starting to reach the limitations of what it could do and was starting to hold the series back more than actively helping, which could arguably be seen in RE0. The dev team needed to find a way to mix things up from a gameplay perspective. Better hardware was allowing for better visuals and better ways of approaching level design, and other series were taking advantage of this with DMC and Haunting Ground even using what was called a dynamic camera, which was a set of static cameras that moved with the character rather than be stuck in a single place, which was originally intended to be for RE4. So in terms of evolving the series, and I apologize to the RE purists that aren't going to appreciate this sentiment, shifting the camera's perspective is possibly one of the smartest things the devs could do in pushing the series forward even if some of the devs were supposedly apprehensive about changing something so tied to the series at this point. The change in camera made the game's controls easier to grasp as soon as you grabbed onto it. The new perspective meant the tank control system was easier to figure out than trying to maintain a constant understanding of how pressing up would move the character in relation to the camera's POV, and this meant the game was more appealing to a wider audience that want controls that feel easy to get and not have to struggle with cameras that make it difficult to see enemies after they were already shown to you. Unbeknownst to the creators though, after RE4 blew up in the mainstream, this camera system would become a standard for any game that included guns for years. Not just for horror games, but even action titles. 
This popularity would then mean that this new perspective had to be included in all future Resident Evil games, since that was what the new audience began to expect of it, regardless of old fans' disappointment. Now the question you might be wondering is, could RE4 have simply adopted a more dynamic camera system like DMC or Hunting Ground? Something of a compromise between the classic fixed and over-the-shoulder perspectives that appeased old fans and newcomers? Honestly, yeah. Looking at how it worked in the Hookman demo, there definitely was a lot of potential in using a dynamic camera that also incorporated the over-the-shoulder perspective for aiming. However, after the dev team decided they needed to change up the classic Resident Evil format, and chose to refocus more on action mechanics with 4, anything but the over-the-shoulder camera perspective would have been counterintuitive to what the devs were going for and that is most highly demonstrated in one of the most iconic moments of the game, the village sequence. Un forastero! Possibly one of the strongest openings in gaming, the village sequence does an amazing job at setting the stage for the rest of Resident Evil 4. As Leon walks into a dreary village area where a strange farming community has impaled one of the local police that brought you there onto a makeshift pyre, while the residents are simply going about their farming business, confirming that something isn't right here. As soon as one of them notice you creeping through though, things get thrown into overdrive, as the rest of the village is made aware of your existence, and a mob of villagers gradually flood in while you scramble around trying to survive the growing mob with the very limited resources you have. After surviving a couple waves of these infected villagers, including one chainsaw enthusiast that can kill you instantly if you aren't paying attention, further pushing this sense of desperate survival, all of them are led away by the sound of a church bell. And with that, the game drops its title, as if dropping a figurative mic. Though it's worth noting that the title is noticeably missing the four, as if saying this was the new Resident Evil. I remember playing this section as a kid and being blown away. You could really feel how different RE4 was going to be with this sequence. And the devs seemed to know this too, since it was used as a sort of vertical slice in the demo preview disc for the game. As opposed to the more claustrophobic hallways and alleys of the earlier RE games, where a couple of zombies were a daunting problem that had you debating on if it was worth the trouble, 4 went for more expansive levels full of enemies with complex and aggressive AI, in order to replace that looming, eerie feeling with high tension, and you weren't allowed to just run away. This led into a more tactical approach to combat than any of the previous entries. The game was more generous with ammo drops than previous Resident Evils, especially since enemies could now drop them after death, but more ammo was regularly required, especially during the earlier sections when the mechanics of the game are still being learned. The wider open levels meant there was more room to keep distance from the Ganados, but also more directions that enemies could close in on you from, which required better control over your aim in order to properly ward them off, hence the change to the camera perspective. The classic camera and playstyle couldn't have worked with this design, since the game is going for a more intense, almost intimate feeling by putting you right into the horde, rather than from a disconnected viewpoint but not going too far by going for the first person perspective. Essentially, Force focus was not about the strategy of preserving ammunition and resources for the long term, but instead about successfully using them in the short term by applying more pressure in how effective you are at using those resources. From a level design perspective, levels were no longer the complex, interconnected puzzle boxes to solve like that of the Spencer Mansion or the RPD, they were now stretched out desolate forests and mines designed to be longer and broader in scope in order to accommodate this shift in playstyle, which is highlighted most at the start of Chapter 1-2, where Leon wakes up after being knocked unconscious by Mendez. The level is quite different from any previous RE game, being full of bridges and wide spaces designed for sniper use once everyone's favorite merchant character sells it to you. Got something that might interest you. <laughs> Where you're typically the one caught by surprise in these games, you are now the one in control, preying on the enemy being unaware. Though as soon as you're exposed, things ramp up yet again as Ganados rush towards you at every angle, 
The game wants you to feel empowered, but never have too much control and always feel a bit uneasy with what's coming next, which is further heightened by the music that cranks up once the parasite infected creatures of the game know where you are that adds to that feeling of suspense. While I didn't quite realize it, the music was the thing that always kept me on edge playing RE4 as a kid because it only started up once enemies were aware of your presence. So it was a clear association that when music was playing, something was coming after you, creating a sort of anxiety once the first notes start to play. So even if it seemed like you were safe, the music continuing to play meant something was still around, waiting. Unlike the city settings of the previous sequels, where there was a sense of something familiar in the urban locales, the strange Spanish villages and ancient castles create an eerie foreign tone to them, especially upon the first playthrough as you delve into this unfamiliar terrain in order to find out what's going on with this strange cult. And this is where the game's able to create a lot of its suspense. When I first played it, I dreaded going onto the lake or the hold up in the cabin, not because of the fights themselves, but because of how the game builds up that anxiety, through things like the growling through the gates when first walking past the Ganados hold, or the shift to pitch black night before the return to the village. Look, I was 12 when I played this alone in the dark, cut me some slack. Though upon reflection, I do genuinely wish they could have incorporated the hallucination trips from the Hookman build in order to really up that creep factor especially since Leon becomes infected with the Plagas virus that the Ganados have, which is likely a carryover from him being infected in those earlier builds. There's never any gameplay relevance to it, and it only comes up in cutscenes as a sort of narrative ticking clock, which to me is a bit of a missed opportunity for what could have added more unique sequences where he's dealing with the delusions caused by the Plagas virus. Speaking of the Plagas, after about 4 or 5 games, zombies in Resident Evil had become kind of predictable, and didn't really instill as much fear anymore since they were an understood thing at this point. So Ganados were used as a subtle replacement for them, which at face value feels like a distinction without a difference. Both were mindlessly infected humans that slowly creep towards you in large mobs, but Ganados seemed to have more intelligence to them. They had a more human factor to them, which just makes their vacant mannerisms that much more unsettling. The most significant change with the Ganados though was the parasites they were hosting. Headshots were always an effective way to get rid of a zombie, but now headshots could possibly result in their heads bursting forth the Plagas virus, making them even more dangerous. The head popping was based on damage, but that meant an instant kill headshot wasn't as effective as we had come to expect and could immediately be followed by the Plagas emerging and becoming a worse problem. In retrospect, seemingly removing what was their main weakness was an effective way of approaching the traditional zombies of Resident Evil that everyone had become familiar with. However, there's a major over-reliance on the Ganado type enemies. After playing through 10 missions or so, you become pretty familiar with how they work. The later game tries to compensate for this by progressively giving them more weapons, armor, and different Plagas types in order to make them more challenging, but that actually ends up making them less scary, since it removes the creepy rural cult aspect to them. Once you get to the point of fighting enemies that are shooting miniguns and have Mad Max armor, they're basically just dudes at that point, which isn't that intimidating. And that's disappointing since the other creatures of the game are great and underutilized in comparison. The now traditional doggo enemies have the capability to spread out tentacles from their body while attempting to tear out your neck. The Navistadors can hide in the shadows and become invisible while creeping towards you, so you have to look for tells of where they are, though they become a tad pain in the ass while dealing with them as a flying group. And the blind guardors react to sound, so you can't just run away from them or they'll slice you to death. Which is a major switch up from pretty much every other enemy in the series where avoiding them is the better option. Then there's the regenerators, which are the standout creatures of 4. Once you get to the island locale near the end of the game, the Ganados and Plagas have become pretty normal and all the mystery surrounding them has been explained. Things are getting a tad samey by this point. 
Then you arrive at the laboratory and find a strange autopsy that's been abandoned. Once you pick up the freezer key needed to progress, the Regenerator's theme begins, accompanied by his raspy gasps. And as you attempt to leave, this gross monstrosity blocks your way out. Before you're given an actual answer to these enemies in the form of the infrared scope, you have to fight this one off without it, which is possibly one of the most terrifying moments in the game. Throughout the early sections, you're groomed to believe that when you hit something with your shotgun, it will go away but the Regenerator just keeps coming. Taking out their legs doesn't even solve the problem, since they have the ability to lunge from the ground to attack before healing. Eventually, it does go down for good after taking enough damage, but facing something unceremoniously where all your weapons didn't seem to work was super effective. Overall, when you take a look back at the first half of Resident Evil 4, namely the sections in the village and in the castle, it had everything that makes a good horror game. The camera perspective, the level design, the atmosphere, and the enemies of 4 all still worked in making a classic Resident Evil style of survival horror while still evolving it into a more modern take for 2005, and were smart decisions by Mikami and the dev team for taking the series in a new direction. However, as the game comes closer to the end, as Leon arrives at the island section and fights to stop Sadler's international terrorist cult plot, a lot of the tension RE4 has built up fades away. Or it would be better to say shifts towards pure action excitement. Aside from the progressive escalation of weapons, one of the most prominent causes of this shift, and is arguably the big elephant in the room as to what largely caused the descent of the series, was the action prompts. And the most controversial addition of the game, the quick time events. Ya es hora de asplastar. Leading up to 6, which included Leon crashing a plane through a major city and Chris fighting a giant B.O.W. monster in a jet, Resident Evil had been slowly escalating the action aspects since 2 ended on a high octane train sequence and a sick rock track, and 3 concluded with the government decimating the entire town of Raccoon City and the world now dealing with acts of bioterrorism on a mass scale. So with that in mind, a terrorist plot to infect the daughter of the president with the Plagueis virus in order to corrupt the president himself for the sake of world domination wasn't that far out there. But just like how Aliens pushed the film franchise from the slow menacing nature of the first film to fighting hallways full of xenomorphs, the more action game elements are where Resident Evil started to tip the scales towards full action over horror. As much as critics of 4 wish to blame it, it wasn't the shift in camera perspective that changed Resident Evil as a series for the worst. It was the inclusion of quick time events and action prompts that turned Leon Kennedy from a cop that was able to face off against a few zombies into an action hero doing spin kicks to entire groups of enemies and surviving trap doors that would have killed lesser men. Don't fall for this old trick. Noticing that with cinematics, players became more passive since they saw it as a movie to watch between bits of gameplay, the devs wanted to make the game's cinematics more engaging. Resident Evil 4's cinematics lead, Yoshiaki Hirabayashi, stated that, In a traditional game scenario, players change from being active participants to bystanders as cinematics begin and play out. The player may not pay close attention or might even put the controller down. And either way, that's not what we want. So QTEs were designed to keep you involved in the cutscenes, in order to keep tensions high in places where players would often kick back and relax. Which in hindsight, was another clever design element for approaching a horror slash action game. Shenmue would use QTEs a couple years prior as a way to bridge gameplay and story, but RE4 was using them in an entirely different context, since they were designed around surviving. For example, once you finish the boss fight with Del Lago, you think you can finally relax, take a breather, until the rope tied to the monster cinches around Leon's leg and you have to struggle to cut the line to keep Leon from being dragged into the depths. By adding in a design element where death could even occur during cinematics, it made it feel like you could never really relax in moments where we had been trained to think it was okay. And while we've come to hate QTEs nowadays, in 2005, it was a game changer. However, 
RE4 overplays its hand with this. The occasional QTEs act as a way to keep things intense, like the knife fight between Leon and Krauser, but a secondary side effect of these moments as the game continues is that it starts to portray Leon as a sort of ridiculous superhero, such as being able to flip through a laser grid hallway. I love the smart alecky, you're gonna have to do better than that, attitude Leon has to a lot of the dangers in the game, but from a horror game standpoint, these moments make it hard to have any sort of fear for him as your player avatar, since he's shown to have the ability to survive the most ludicrous things, like outrunning a giant Spanish Napoleon statue. While fans were a bit polarized about the QTEs being in the game when it first came out, 4's major success ended up popularizing the whole press X to live mechanic that is still quite prevalent today and as future RE sequels started to rely more and more on them in order to keep the action high, Resident Evil as a series shifted from something like Evil Dead to Evil Dead 2, where the crazy action absurdity became the focus more than it being genuinely creepy. And what didn't help with this was the action prompts. As a way to make the player feel more involved in the moment to moment gameplay, the game includes context sensitive prompts that come up during certain moments like how you can fight off things grabbing onto you by mashing a button. Because doing that while going, get off, get off, get off, was a common response while being gripped by zombies in any of the past games. So it was smart to incorporate that into the actual design. These mechanics make for a fun action game that has a lot of replayability, since it adds more depth and intensity to the combat. But the more it comes up in the game, and the more you know how to incorporate it into your gameplay style, it's what drags down the horror tones of the game, since you become even more invincible. If you could only use your weapons and whatever ammo you could find, the game would be better able to keep the feelings of desperate survival of the early game all the way through, since it would mean that you'd have to be incredibly smart and effective with your resources, and every encounter would matter to your survival. But once you know the trick on how to take on Ganados and every other creature, not so much. When you know you can kneecap enemies and then do a spin kick or just stand over them and stab them with your knife to finish them off, a lot of that suspense pretty much dissipates. There were always goofy workarounds for enemies in previous Resident Evil games in order to preserve ammo, like baiting a zombie grab only to casually strafe it and continue forward, but it still felt like you were in danger of these enemies and were just barely getting away from them. There are enemies and moments in 4 that are as unnerving and downright scary, but having the action prompts, combined with the more powerful weapons in the game, really prohibits it from feeling like they're a threat. The combat system is super fun and has a lot of replayability, hell I've played the game about 10 times and I'm still finding new tech, but it's at odds with any type of fear the game tries to instill which is unfortunate since I think Mikami could have had a game that had both without relying so heavily on the action side of things. Similar to how the action heavy QTE moments started to escalate more and more as the series progressed, the reliance on action prompts started to undermine the survival horror mechanics of later games, since a healthy majority of enemies could be handled through extremely minimal ammo use and melee combat leading to being able to kick through a horde of zombies in RE6 before doing a running bulldog finisher. The action prompts and QTEs of RE4 made it harder and harder to fear for your life as Leon, as you were backflipping out of harm's way, throwing knives with dead aim precision, and suplexing cult priests. One could argue acting as bodyguard for Ashley when she saved acted as a sort of counterbalance to Leon's greater capabilities, where you fear for her well-being as much as your own, but even that can only go so far in being able to maintain any sense of dread. If anything, it's further empowering in a thematic sense, since it gives you this feeling of being some action hero protecting the scared innocent. Following in Resident Evil tradition, you even do a final victory lap through hordes of enemies at the end, though this time with a helicopter tag team partner. Rest in peace, Mike. Before facing off against a mutated Saddler that you eventually have to blow up with a rocket launcher. And with the villain finally defeated and mission accomplished, our hero rides their jet ski off into the sunset. <laughs>
before having to do the same thing again a couple years later in a never-ending cycle of bioterrorism that all the Resident Evil protagonists seem to be stuck in. Story of my life. Come back at a time. Resident Evil 4 is an odd paradox. It was a massively influential game, and I don't think anyone can genuinely dispute that. Just like how Ada's design in 4 is objectively her best. However, everything it did well also inspired everything that dragged down later Resident Evil titles, and even other survival horror games, because many game designers, even those that were involved with Resident Evil 4, seem to forget what made this game so special. There was a sort of balance between the action-focused shooty sections and the tense horror moments that seemed to have been forgotten. Capcom and the devs learned all the wrong lessons about what made the game work so well, which over the years progressively warped the series and how we perceived it. Even today, the series exists in the shadow of Resident Evil 4's legacy, where RE games' qualities are built around how closely they do or don't emulate 4, and whether that makes the game scary or not, similar to how they're judged if it's any good based on if they have the attaché case mechanics meaning nothing has been good since. But looking back on it, does RE4 deserve the legacy it has? After years of publishing similar zombie outbreak games that were starting to struggle with a lackluster console that the publisher had been tied to, and a quickly changing market after the turn of the millennium, the creators were faced with evolving the series to have a larger mass market appeal, while still trying their best to appease the fanbase of what is now known as classic Resident Evil. With all that in mind, Resident Evil 4 came out worlds better than anyone could have expected. And I'm sorry to the classic RE fans that hate the trends in Resident Evil that 4 started. I'm not a fan of some of them either, but Leon's European Island Adventure is an undeniably fantastic game, regardless of the effects it would later have. Capcom just didn't know what to do with the series following 4 and just decided to chase trends by continually cranking the action dial, since it seemed to be what was making them money, which was one amongst a long line of bad choices from Capcom that could have ruined it as a company, which might be something worth talking about. Another day. Thanks for watching, and come back anytime.